Well, I'm hoping someone can help me. Maybe you're a pastor. Because I opened up my American Standard Version of my Bible to Isaiah 27, 12. And it says Jehovah will beat off his fruit. Why does it say that? Now, I know you might be thinking, Titus 1, 15 says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. And so I'm not just cherry-picking scriptures that seem to be off-color because I'm trying to dishonor the Lord. I'm a Bible believer. I believe in the Bible and its power to change people's lives. It certainly changed my life. God is my God. Jesus is my God. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a spirit-filled, Bible-believing, fundamentalist Christian, but I am really confused. And I'm hoping somebody out there can help me. Because I'm coming across things in my Bible that I do not understand. And so, you have to ask yourself, if you, pastor, had an American Standard Bible on the pulpit, would you be able to choose this text as your sermon text on Sunday morning? Would you have the temerity to read this out loud on Sunday morning? Do you think there might be any reaction from the people in your congregation? Certainly if you read it out loud and you looked up at the youth group section, there'd be some snickers at the very least, probably howls of laughter and some shock. So it's not just me. If you read this out loud, Sister Beulah in the third row is going to keel over and have a coronary. You're going to have to raise her from the dead on Sunday morning. Well, imagine my surprise when I opened up my common English Bible and I read Isaiah 720. On that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired from beyond the Euphrates with the king of Assyria, the head and the pubic hair. Well... This seemed a little racy to me as well, that God would be shaving someone's pubic hair. So I decided to look up all the different versions of this passage, and I found something very interesting. First of all, on Bible Hub, Isaiah 7.20 spells razor, R-A-S-O-R, in the King James Version. But then, when you go over to Bible Gateway, it spells it R-A-Z-O-R in the King James Version. It's the same passage and the same version, but it's spelled differently on this platform and also on Blue Letter Bible. I mean, it almost seems like somebody's trying to mess with the Bible because you would think that the King James Bible on the different platforms would have the same spelling of the same word in the same version, the same verse. How could that be? Anyway, I started to look up some of the other versions. I found the New International Version said that the Lord would use a razor to shave the heads and the private parts. Then the New American Standard says that God will shave the hair of the legs. And this is where my jaw dropped. When I looked up Strong's Concordance definition of hair of the legs, I found that it was a euphemism for the female genital. The word pudenda. That's the Strong's definition. Well, pudenda is a person's external genitals, especially a woman's. So technically, hair of leg equals pudenda, which means a woman's genitals. Therefore, you could read this as for the following. On that day, the Lord will shave with a razor, hired from regions beyond the Euphrates, the head and the female's genitals. Now, I'm no theologian, but I just showed you what the dictionary is saying and the concordance and the real meaning of this. And I found this to be disturbing. I'm, I mean, I'm hoping somebody can help me understand how this can be in my Bible. Why does it seem inescapable that at the very least one clear interpretation of this passage could be what I'm saying. How can my Bible possibly be saying anything to the effect that God would be shaving a woman's vagina? 
Now, don't get mad at me if it sounds like I'm a blasphemer when I'm reading from the Bible text on the screen that's in your own Bible and showing the concordance meaning. I mean, is it clear that I'm at least attempting to rightly divide the word? The problem is I'm just beginning. So these discoveries led me to Isaiah 3, 17, where I found the Lord is discovering the secret parts of women. In the Aramaic version, he's stripping their bodies naked. And the International Standard Version, he's exposing their private parts. Well, these are like so shocking that I, I mean, I wasn't sure what to think about what I was seeing. This is horrible, but unfortunately, this was nothing compared to what I was about to find when I opened up to Numbers 11, verse 12 in the King James Bible. Because over in Numbers, I find descriptions of men breastfeeding. Numbers 11, 12. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child. Now, I'm no theologian, I'm certainly not a doctor, but this imagery and what this is describing just seems vulgar to me. It goes against the natural order of things that God has created. It just seems sordid and unclean, and I'm horrified that it's in my Bible. How can any Bible translation speak of such things? Men do not have milk in their breasts. What kind of imagery is this? It doesn't matter to me if this is a translation error either. I mean, if the translators are that incompetent and clueless to translate something into English so that it's telling me that men are nursing children from their breasts, then how am I to trust my soul to this book? I was always told anyone can read and understand the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit. But if the plain words on the page don't really mean what they say, then how am I to trust this book at all? Well, then I found Isaiah 60, 16. It's also talking about this kind of thing. And I, you know, I was just horrified. I'm, I've created this video in hopes that some pastor could contact me and help me understand how my Bible is talking about anyone sucking the breast of kings. I'm just wondering, Pastor, are you horrified by this also? I mean, it's disgusting. It's perverted, and I don't really care what the original language says or it's moder it's a modernization. How can I trust the book if the people that are modernizing it or translating it are either perverts or they're incompetent fools turning out impossible nonsense for us to be led astray by? I started to ask the Lord if he was involved in this somehow. Is he also going to start showing up in my Bible, breastfeeding babies? Because I certainly don't remember any teaching on that in my 40 years of following the Lord, including 11 years of full-time ministry in a large church of over 2,000 as a youth pastor and a worship leader, and 20 years in lay ministry. So I'm sure you can imagine my horror when I came to Revelations 1.13 in the King James Bible. And I read these words. And in the midst of seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. This is describing Jesus. Well, the word paps... <clears throat> in the concordance is the word mastos from the base of 3145, properly female breast. Is paps the same as breast? Well, the word paps is mastos in the Greek. It refers to a woman's breast and is only used that way in the Bible. A man's chest is stethos. Every other place in the New Testament, stethos is used for our Lord's chest. So John 13, 25, he then lying on Jesus' breast, stethos, or John 21, 20. Then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast, stethos. 
not mastos. So the idea of Jesus having female breasts seems so foreign to me that I'm, I'm really at a loss for words at this point. I mean, does this seem right to you? I said to myself, well, at least there's nothing about Jesus interacting with infants in the Bible. Because if I see that, I might start getting really worried. My Bible is going to start telling me that Jesus is going to be breastfeeding now, too. And I thought, I don't know where, anywhere in the Bible where Jesus is doing that until I came across Luke 18, 15. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. So, I saw this and I'm like, oh, come on, man. I said, not Jesus, too. How can that be in the Bible? Well, Jesus has the breasts of a female. Now they're bringing infants to him. I don't remember any of this. What are they bringing him infants for? And why is he, and why is he wearing a girdle? What is the deal with the girdle? Because while we're on the subject, he's not alone. Looks like the angels are wearing girdles also in Revelation 15, 6. Having their breasts girded with golden girdles. I mean, something very strange seems to be going on here. I'm not sure what it is. I mean, I, I thought the Bible was like a holy book. It teaches us about holiness and teaches us about sexual purity and that there's absolutes like homosexuality is a sin and that kind of thing. So, of course, you can imagine my confusion when I got to Luke 17 in the King James Bible. And I read these words. I tell you that in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. So you have two men in a bed and one is taken apparently in the rapture. Now, I think that you could probably have a hundred reasonable men would agree with you that if you talk about two men in a bed and then two women grinding together, that, you know, it's not a stretch to get the idea that they might be having sex together. I don't think that you can just relegate that perception to just people that are perverted. I mean, generally, men do not sleep in the same bed. So, it was very disturbing when I found this because other Gospels say that it was two men in a field and then two women grinding grain, but not in Luke 17 in the KJV. Why does Luke 17 seem to leave those other things out to make it look like these people are gay and it's okay? So if you say that two women are grinding together, it's not hard to see how someone could also interpret that as two lesbians having sex. Because over in Job 31.9, I found that grinding is a euphemism in the Bible for sex. If mine heart have been deceived by a woman, or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down upon her. And let's not forget this term, bowing down, is also a euphemism for sex, because we're going to see that in the next passage. The problem here is that one of these people gets raptured, which means that my Bible seems to be teaching that homosexuality is okay with God and that practicing homosexuals and lesbians will go to heaven. And I thought homosexuality was a sin and that God will judge whoremongers. I mean, it's certainly understandable how someone could take this interpretation. And it's not just me. Here's an article from the BibleThumpingLiberal.com from 2011, Luke's Gay Apocalypse, Two Women Grinding Together. The conclusion of this article is that you can practice homosexuality and still go to heaven in the Bible rapture. I would not really have a good defense against this position. This person, by the way, is very astute. They're very knowledgeable in the Bible. 
They understand how to properly exegete scripture and all kinds of stuff. And they're coming up with the same observation. So it's not just me. So I thought, well, if there seems to be new passages in my Bible that are talking about sexual perversion, I wonder if that scripture about David and Jonathan is still the same, or maybe has that somehow seen to turn for the worse. So I went over to 1 Samuel 20, verse 41, and it reads this, And as soon as the lad was gone, David rose out of a place towards, toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. There's that term of bowing, which was clearly associated with sex in Job, and they kissed one another and wept one with another. And then you have this very odd statement, until David exceeded. I don't remember that being in my Bible. So I looked up this passage, this word exceeded, and it means to grow. Furthermore, it's from the primitive root properly to twist i.e., or in other words, to be causatively or to make large in various senses as in body. David grew. David became large in his body. I don't think I need to elaborate on what this seems to be saying. I mean, we're all adults here because you've got two men who are bowing down, which is a euphemism for sex, they're kissing, and then as a result, David is getting an erection. <sighs> well, <clears throat> with all these new discoveries, I started to search out things that I thought were out of order from the character and nature of God, I started to look for things that went against orthodoxy and widely accepted doctrines of the Bible. I thought, what about angels? Aren't angels always represented as male in the Bible? Well, I looked around and I came across Zechariah 5, 9, and I found a passage that's very interesting. It says, then lifted I up mine eyes and looked and beheld there came out two women and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Now this was a new passage to me. I never heard of it before and they, they certainly are women with wings and they're lifting up the ephah between earth and heaven, whatever that means. It doesn't say that these are angels, but it doesn't say that they aren't angels either. And in all of my Bible study and church attendance, it seems so odd to me that this passage never came across my attention until I started looking for these types of things in the Bible. I mean, Pastor, did you ever know that there were women with wings in the Bible until right now? So I started to search for things that I thought were inconsistent with the character of the God that I know, things that seem blasphemous or contrary to orthodox biblical teaching. <clears throat> These passages <laughs> that I've already shared should be enough to alarm any fundamentalist Bible believer, but unfortunately, as I opened my eyes, I found even more. As I thought, this can't be. So I searched through scriptures and I found things that seemed to be contrary. I came across the most astonishing, horrifying scripture of all. This passage that I'm about to share with you goes against everything that I know about my Jesus, both from scripture and from personal relationships with him. This one passage has created a flood of questions in my mind, and I'm reaching out to you in hopes that you can help me understand how this can possibly be in any Bible translation. And you know, I don't really care 
what the original language says. I don't care what the Bible translators did or didn't do. It's in my Bible. And somebody needs to give me some answers whether or not this is what Jesus is truly like. Because the Jesus that I know told me things like this. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. That's Luke 6, 27. And then over in Matthew 5, 44, we have the same kind of teaching. That we're to bless those who curse you. However, when I turned to Luke 19, 27, I found the most astonishing passage in the Bible. Because it reads, this is a quote of Jesus, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. The English words in my Bible, in almost every translation, are telling me that Jesus is telling his followers to bring people in front of him and slay them before him. Now, I was told that this is just a parable of the future judgment, but those words ring hollow to me. What am I to do with this passage? This goes against everything that I've been taught from Jesus about who he is and how I'm to live my life. I mean, how am I going to go to the missionary field into a Muslim country and win souls? What do I say to the Muslim when I tell him about the love of Jesus and the Jesus that I know who is merciful and kind and teaches us to forgive and walk in love? What will I say to him when he shows me this passage and asks me, John, why should I convert to Christianity? I already have a God that teaches me jihad. Jihad Jesus. And why is the wolf laying down with the lamb? I always knew it to be the lion laying down with the lamb. And of course, imagine my surprise when I read in Isaiah 36, 12 about people eating their own dung and drinking their own piss. Isaiah 36, 12. And so when I found that, I found that uh, I would look up and see if there was other passages about people pissing. And I found that there was actually six references to people pissing against a wall in the Bible. And so I started to look up similar things. And I found that there's unicorns in the Bible. And how many times do you think that your Bible mentions unicorns? If I told you that it was nine, would you be surprised? Well, here are the passages that reference unicorns in the Bible. So I finally decided to just take a break. I just went back to reading the Bible for pleasure and, you know, just to know God. And then I came across Ezekiel 23, where it talks about lusting after her lovers whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emissions were like that of horses. And then I found all these giant places with giant names, four and five, six syllables, people's names with five syllables. And, and even Isaiah 8 it talks about Isaiah, the prophet, where he says, Then I made love to the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Well, this was unprecedented for me. I really had no, no reference for that. Nor did I have any reference when I found Leviticus 12, where God was giving instructions on how he was to be approached in the sacrifice. And they were to give a pigeon or a turtle dove. But if they were uh, short on funds, they were able to bring a lamb or two turtles. So now it appears that my Bible is teaching that God condones 
the sacrifice of reptiles. And Jesus is now referenced as a thing in Luke 1.35. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born shall be called the Son of God. So, what does that mean? What does it mean if... The Bible is referring to Jesus as a holy thing. It seems really blasphemous to me. Maybe you can help me understand this. And therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. So it appears that Peter's running around naked in the New Testament. And of course, as I read, I constantly finding these things that were foreign to me, I found that now God condones sin in Hosea 4.14, where he says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. Or 2 Corinthians 11.8, where it says that I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do, do you service. Well, if I'm a second story guy and I get saved in your church, and then I read that, I'm, I'm really blessed because now I realize I can continue to support myself doing B&Es and still go to heaven. Because one of the apostles was certainly busted into the offering. After they took the offering, he'd sneak in there and grab the loot. And Proverbs 26.10 tells me the great God that formed all things both rewards the fool and rewards transgressors. Now, don't get mad at me. I didn't put this in the Bible. You can't call me a blasphemer because I'm quoting scripture. And you can feel free to show me how I'm grossly misinterpreting the passages to come to these conclusions if you can. But I think you've got your work cut out for you. Let's see, there's many more passages like these. I'm just stopping here for the sake of time, but these have thrown me into a tailspin after 40 years of walking with the Lord. Maybe there's a pastor out there that would be kind enough to provide me with some explanation that could extricate me from this hole I've fallen into. My email is pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. Unless someone can provide me with some valid explanation, though, as to how I'm misinterpreting most of these I'm going to be forced to conclude that there is some sort of event that caused the Bible to be changed into a book that I can no longer recognize. A book that I can no longer hold and trust and follow in the same way that I've used to. I hope this is not the case. I mean, how could it be happening? It seems like it would have to be supernatural. Maybe, maybe the people talking about the Mandela effect is supernaturally changing the Bible or right after all? I don't know. But something's happening because now you have God no longer punishing whoremongers. You've got one apostle stealing from the churches, another apostle's running around naked. God's rewarding transgressors. You've got people sacrificing reptiles to God. Jesus is now a holy thing. Isaiah's making a love child with the prophetess. You have a description of men with reproductive organs like donkeys and having orgasms like horses. You got people pissing all over the place. And worse, you got people eating and drinking their piss and their feces. The wolf is dwelling with the lamb instead of the lion. You got Jihad Jesus chopping people's heads off because they got out of line. And then, of course, you got Charlie's Angels over here flying around playing frisbee with the ephod. You've got what appears to be David getting an erection after kissing and bowing down to Jonathan. You've got two men in a bed together with women grinding together. And then one of them is raptured, which is clearly seeming to throw an endorsement behind the idea that homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> of course, you've got Jesus with female breasts and then people bringing him infants, and you have other men breastfeeding people like this is totally normal or something. 
This imagery is graphic. It literally says they will suck the breasts of kings. And you've got God himself discovering women's genitals, then he's shaving women's genitals with the razor, and then seemingly, and most blasphemously, you have wording in one version of the Bible which seems to clearly describe the great God Jehovah masturbating. So my email is pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. My YouTube channel is Wake Up or Else. My website is wakeuporelse.com. I'd be interested to hear from any pastor that thinks he can help me to understand what it is that I'm seeing in my Bible. Thank you for listening.